wait, wait, wait. It was my word of the year. I wrote it on sticky notes and little post-its. I put it on my mirror. I put it in the bathroom, anywhere where I could find space to remind myself to wait. I am waiting on the Lord. It became my mantra. And then I began to imagine I was living in some kind of metaphorical doctor's office, waiting for the door to open and a nurse to kindly usher me in. I thought I had shown up on time for my appointment, but now I was just sitting in a quiet waiting room, respectfully waiting, as boom bands were outside playing and life was happening to other people. Meanwhile, what was I doing other than waiting? I would try to entertain myself and flip through magazines and imagine the day when my life too would look picture perfect. But the days and weeks seemed to pass by while I sat there wondering what the doctor might say. Other people came in, sat for a moment, got called in, and came out a few minutes later. Some were happy, others tried to hide their tears. But when would it be my turn to see the doctor? When would I know my fate? How long would I have to wait? The longer I sat there, the more questions I had. Maybe I should just leave. Come back another day. As the questions and answers passed through my mind, my emotions would rise and fall like some kind of nauseating carousel ride I couldn't escape. story is not unique. All around the world, single women are feeling trapped inside the metaphorical waiting room, waiting for their real life to begin. You can't go back to the way it was before, and you can't move forward without some kind of clearance from God. But what if waiting for the Lord was never supposed to look like that? What if we've been doing it wrong? I believe that waiting on the Lord is an essential part of our walk with God. But what is the purpose of it? To test our patience? To determine our faithfulness? When we imagine our waiting experience is supposed to look like the one I described, then we inevitably conclude that God is standing in the way of our progress with one big stop sign, and we can't do anything until he gives us the green light. And if this is what you think is happening to you, I want you to know, I get it, and I've been there too. But I no longer believe that that's what God wants waiting on the Lord to look like. Hi, I'm Lily Matanguiza, and I help women date deliberately, court with confidence, and pursue their God-given desire for a Christ-centered marriage. I want to thank you for joining me today. It is always a pleasure to be able to talk about the issues that kill our dreams, steal our time, and destroy our God-given desire for a Christ-centered marriage. In today's episode, I want to talk about waiting on the Lord, what it really looks like, how we might be doing it wrong, and what we can do instead. What I'm hoping for in this episode is that you will get a more Christ-centered idea of what waiting on the Lord really looks like. But more importantly, you'll come to know that God is for you and not against you. You don't have to feel guilty for taking initiative or feel bad for taking your time as you pursue a Christ-centered marriage. The most important thing is a commitment to love. Love for yourself, love for God, and love for the one you choose to spend your life with. First of all, you've probably been told that waiting on the Lord is the key to having a Christ-centered marriage, and I want you to know I absolutely agree, but I think we need to be extremely clear about what waiting on the Lord is and what it's not. To begin with, you need a clear definition of waiting and the purpose of waiting. It is commonly believed that waiting on the Lord is the same kind of waiting we do in doctor's offices or airplane terminals. It's the necessary thing you have to endure in order to get to where you want to go. But what if that's the wrong way of looking at it? 
In Hebrew, the word that we've interpreted as waiting actually implies binding yourself together with him. That means it's all about taking time to be in his presence and letting his presence transform you. It's not about being inactive or spending a lot of time in this metaphorical waiting room. Instead, it's about having all you need in the moment from God. The difference is subtle, but it makes a big difference in the way you pursue your God-given desire for a Christ-centered marriage. When you imagine God, the way I did, as holding something back, we also see ourselves as not ready, not deserving, unprepared, and incapable of having our God-given desire. Ironically, the longer we spend in this place of lack, the less prepared we are. Waiting on the Lord should not diminish your ability to achieve your God-given desire. It should improve it. But if waiting on the Lord looks like sitting at home, eating ice cream, alone on your sofa in your comfy pants, watching Netflix, how much are you really growing? And I'm not saying that there isn't a time and place for Netflix and ice cream. I'm simply saying, let's stop calling that waiting on the Lord. When the women I coach say they're waiting on the Lord, they usually mean I'm not interested in taking an action towards pursuing marriage. They tend to have an underlying belief that marriage will happen to them and requires no effort on their part. And any action they take could actually hinder God's plans for them. I want to point out that this is a really fear-based mindset. There's usually a lot going on here, so let's break it down. First of all, there's this idea that marriage is something that happens to you. A lot of people like to point to Rebecca as an example of a biblical woman who didn't have to do anything to get a man. Everything was arranged by God for her. But I want to remind you that this is not a prescription for how you should behave. Instead, it's a description of what happened in her particular case. I also want to point out that she had a choice. They asked her whether or not she wanted to go with Abraham's messenger to be Isaac's wife, and she agreed. Second, there's this idea that you are capable of interfering with God's plans and thwarting them altogether. But I want to offer an alternative perspective. Are you ready? Here it is. God wants to co-create a Christ-centered marriage with you. That as you pursue your God-given desire for marriage, you can do it by adopting the mind of Christ and using all your thoughts, emotions, and actions as an opportunity to spend time with God, and in other words, waiting upon the Lord, and reflect on what he is doing in your life. Now, the best way I've discovered for doing this is using the life code, so that no matter what you're doing, you can get a lot of clarity on exactly what is motivating you. Are your thoughts in alignment with what God thinks? If so, they will naturally produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. On the other hand, if your thoughts are producing a lot of fear, doubt, confusion, overwhelm, discouragement, frustration, or anger, you're probably believing a lie. If you can identify the thought that is causing those negative emotions, then you can surrender it to God. Here's a simple prayer that can be really helpful. Lord, I'm thinking whatever you're thinking, and it makes me feel, name your feeling, and when I feel that way, I identify your action. I know you want the best for me, and this is not the best. I want to surrender this thought to you, and I ask that you will replace this thought with your truth and help me adopt it into my life. Amen. I want to share with you a few common messages that you might have heard and show you why they might be doing more damage than good. Now, as I say these things, 
I want you to pay close attention to how they make you feel because the same words will have very different meanings to different people. So pay attention to how you physically respond to these words. Do they make you want to lean in or are they a little bit cringy for whatever reason? Don't think about like, oh, why do I feel that way? Because that produces more shame. Just pay attention to, is this something that makes me lean in and feel warm and, you know, up? Or is it something I move away from? So here's the first one. Just trust God. Is that thought producing assurance because you do trust God? Or does it stir up doubt because you're starting to doubt whether or not you trust God enough? Here's another one. God will provide. How does that statement make you feel? I want you to really try it on in your mind, the same way you would try on a dress. Because while the statement is true, how it's affecting you matters because it's likely bringing up a lot of other things with it. When we can identify why the truth isn't fitting quite right, we'll be able to uncover the destructive thoughts and lies so that we can uproot them. I want to encourage you to stop pretending you don't have doubts. Because if you're human, I am absolutely confident that you've got them. And there's nothing wrong with you for having them. It just means you're human. You might doubt when God is going to provide, or if he is going to provide someone you actually like. You might wonder if God is going to provide the man before or after your eggs begin to dry up or whether he's going to provide a husband at all. And it's that last one I really want to unpack, because the answer is no. God is not going to provide you with a husband, because God did not make a man specifically for you. God made all humans for himself, for him to love and be loved by. We have adopted a lot of really romantic notions and language around the idea of there being one man who is perfect and made for you and who you are destined to be with. And he is your better half and your soulmate. But none of this actually comes from the Bible. Most of it comes from Hollywood, old Greek mythology, romantic poetry, and other sources. And that's fine. But What we want to do is be honest with ourselves about the purpose of our future husband's life, and it is not for him to find you and make you feel loved and happy. His primary purpose, like yours, is to love and be loved by God. Now, your marriage is a brilliant byproduct of that primary purpose. The point here is, We want to really begin to take every thought captive and examine the effect it is having on our lives. Now, if you want more details on exactly how to do that, I recommend going back to episode five, where I talk in detail about how to use the life code to take every thought captive and surrender it to Christ. I want to leave you with this. The Bible says, but those who wait for the Lord But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, 31. The Bible talks about waiting on the Lord and waiting for the Lord. Now, as Christians, we don't have to wait for the Lord anymore. He is ever present. He lives within us. But if we are waiting on the Lord to do something for us, what exactly are we waiting for him to do? Most of the time, we wait for God to change our circumstances. We want God to make our lives different. And this is where I think we're getting it wrong, because God isn't interested in changing our lives so much as he's interested in changing our hearts. When our mind and hearts are in alignment with him, our outcome changes naturally. 
We want God to change our circumstances so that we get to feel better, but God wants to change our minds so that we feel better. It is impossible for us as humans to change our circumstances. What we need to do is learn to accept them the way that they are, as neutral and ultimately for our good. When we come to that realization, then God can begin to transform our mind and heart so that we can take action that is fueled by the fruit of the Holy Spirit and create a totally different outcome. One of the most common questions I get asked is, okay, Lily, if this is what it is, where do I start? And the key to getting started is self-love. I believe that the greatest act of self-love is accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you recognize that God loves you and you decide to embrace that love, that is self-love. We love him because he first loved us. Next, you need to discover your core values because these will give you a better understanding of who you are and what you're looking for in a romantic relationship. It'll also help you understand what you have to offer. To help you, I've created the free Relationship Starter Course. In this three-day mini training series, I'll walk you step-by-step through the entire process of honoring your desire for marriage by knowing who you are in Christ, what your core values are, and creating an irresistible offer. I work with women who want to co-create a Christ-centered relationship with Jesus by learning how to tune in to the still small voice within them. The next step for you is to go to Proverbs2426.com slash start. That's Proverbs2426.com slash start and sign up for this free course. Whether you're single as a Pringle, shy as a mouse, or ready and raring to go, this free course will help you develop the personal awareness and confidence you need to pursue your God-given desire for a Christ-centered marriage. And when you sign up, you'll also be invited to my private Facebook group filled with more amazing women who are honoring their God-given desire for marriage too. Don't let confusion, doubt, and overwhelm stop you from enjoying all the love you long for. You don't have to wait for a relationship to make you feel better. You can begin enjoying an abundance of Christ-centered love today. This free course comes with printable worksheets to help you get clarity around who you are in Christ, and all you need to do is sign up at Proverbs 2426, that's 2426.com slash start. Enter your name and email, and your login information will be emailed to you immediately. By the end of this three-day course, you will be feeling more confident in your identity in Christ and you will have far more clarity about what you want and you will be so excited about what you have to offer in a romantic relationship. Now, at the beginning of this episode, I shared with you how I imagined myself to be stuck inside of this waiting room watching life pass me by. And then one day, when I was feeling particularly frustrated, it's like God asked me, what are you doing here? Flabbergasted, I said, what do you mean, what am I doing here? I've been waiting for you. Why, he asked me. I've been with you all along. 